because the last two lines of the chorus still need a little work. But see, not so hard after all. <laughs> No, no matter with it. <laughs> if you want to know what this teaching looks like, then take a look at our speaker this morning, God's messenger in truth. Whenever and wherever you encounter her, observe. Indeed, if you spend enough time in her presence, you begin to feel the presence of spirit in your own self. Effervescent is an understatement. Brothers and sisters, welcome God's girlfriend, <laughs> Reverend Dr. Sonia Davidson. Okay. Thank you, Steve. That sounds like the sermon has begun. <laughs> oh, sermon. Talk, talk. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome, welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. My talk this morning is on happiness. And I just want to give you an opportunity before I start to express your happiness at seeing in our presence once again after a little rest, Reverend John Scott. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, Reverend John. Such a joy to see you back here in your saddle. <laughs> Happiness. I once overheard someone say with great conviction, no one can be happy all the time. The statement stopped me in my tracks because until then, it had never occurred to me to give it a thought. It did not seem right to me at the time, but I just burst off the thought, thinking, so what if it is true? I never gave it any power, neither to resist, nor to acclaim. However, every now and again, the thought would come back to me. Is this really true? Recently, very recently, I had reason to think about it again, vividly, at the interesting combination of emotions which were displayed across the world at the announcement of the transition of Nelson Mandela. In the midst of what seemed like grieving, there was so much happiness displayed. A recent research reported, paper reported, that 80% of those who are polled worldwide said that they were indeed happy. Is it because happiness means so many different things to different people? Again, I put this question aside and never really thought about it again. I cannot resist sharing this cute story of John Lennon, by John Lennon, of the Beatles' fame. I tell it in his own words. When I was five years old, my mom always told me that happiness was the key to life. When I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote, happy. They told me that I did not understand the assignment. And I told them that they didn't understand me. Wow, they did not understand me. How important it is to hold fast to your truth, even in the midst of what might appear like contradiction. Like all grandmothers, I have a second chance at observing a baby grow up. Sometimes people say it's a first chance, you know, because you're so busy looking after children that you don't get that vivid clarity. 
as when you're a grandmother and you don't have, you can send them back to their home. <laughs> there is laughter, playing, just an unbridled picture of joy, which sometimes can be interrupted in a flash by screams of protest or the most terrifying raucous bawling when a desire is frustrated. However, in another split second, the crying just evaporates if the desire is fulfilled, or amazingly, if the baby is distracted by even the simplest thought. Scientists, again, all over the world, and in every discipline, have developed a fascination for the study of happiness. They have begun to reveal to, e to each other findings which are now embodied in the discipline called the science of happiness. Can you imagine they really have a science called the science of happiness? In fact, they have a course at Harvard University called the science of happiness, and they have a professor of the science of happiness. Whoa. Ernest Holmes, haha, -ha, you are laughing. They have postulated that children are born with their nervous system wired for happiness. In fact, they are born experiencing that happiness. Sometimes you wonder because the first sound is a cry, but trust me, that cry is not a cry of unhappiness. It is a cry of survival, so you can breathe. The pursuit of pleasure Pleasure is a natural instinct which is cultivated and nurtured from birth by doting parents and relatives who sometimes I think ill-advisedly shower all manner of useless objects of pleasure upon a child. The instinct Although useful in moderation, can easily get out of bound, causing us to seek pleasure relentlessly for its own sake. The pursuit of pleasure can be intoxicating and is one of the reasons many of us are initially drawn to the New Thought Movement. Many are mesmerized by the idea that we can and indeed should manifest an abundance of things. Mistaken idea. We can because we have the power to do so. And we should if we desire it because that is how sometimes we use the tools to know that we are, in fact, evolving. Note I say, though, pleasure, pleasure, and not happiness. The researchers of the science of happiness make a clear distinction between happiness and pleasure. And I get it clearly. And I wish, by the end of my talk, for you to do the same. Pleasure, they say, is a transient bodily sensation. Yes, and not the same of, as happiness. Pleasure is short-lived usually and has to be re-stimulated because the biology cannot sustain the awareness for long. Let us take an example. My anticipation of getting a new car Intense pleasure. I get the car, even more intense. I drive it for the first time, ecstasy. I think about it with fondness and pride and anticipation of, as I'm driving it. And even when I'm not driving it, and when I cannot see it, I'm thinking about it. Three months later, not so much. <laughs> In a month later, I take it for granted except when I'm driving it. A year later, even before the new upholstery smell has worn off, 
just another thing that I own. Three years later, the car is still in perfect condition, but a new model comes out, <laughs> and my attention is drawn to that car, and the circle starts all over again. Marketing psychologists take advantage of this tendency to pursue pleasure. In fact, they heighten it by bombarding us with all kinds of external stimuli and all kinds of strategies to make us feel dissatisfied with what we have and to crave for more. They devise all kinds of post-holiday sales and names like Black Friday, I'm not sure why it's Black Friday, and people who are vulnerable get caught up in the fervor and lose themselves in the moment. Recently, an extreme situation was portrayed on the news coming out of the USA. People camped out overnight in their customary manner to be the first to purchase coveted discounted merchandise. No problem. Mm -hmm. However, in one case, as soon as the door was opened, a stampede occurred. People started shoving and fighting, and in one instance, two women were toggling at the same item, no one wanting to give it up. They both fell to the ground, rolling over and over, while others stared at them <laughs> and went on with their grabbing spree. I'm sorry to laugh, but it was funny. Eventually, one of the women, determined to be the proud owner of whatever that was, took out a staser gun and zapped the other. Can you imagine? <laughs> I know I shouldn't laugh, but I know there's something in it that makes me laugh. I use this as an extreme example of the pursuit of pleasure. But this example is not typical. Let's face it, it's extreme. The pursuit of pleasure in the name of happiness is much more subtle and clandestine. It creeps upon us, buried in all kinds of desires. How often do we use the word need to describe something we desire? The only thing one needs is what? Food, water, and air. Perhaps a few other biological agents that I'm not thinking of. So every time you use the word need, watch it. Watch it. Jesus Christ told us, we have come to have life and have it more abundantly. So why not? Have you ever heard that poverty is a sin? Sure. Do we not have prosperity classes at the Temple of Light every year? Yes. Do we not set goals every year in a most uplifting workshop and spend the rest of the year celebrating their fulfillment? What's wrong with that? Nothing. This is our divine birthright to choose any experience we wish to have and to have it. But two points to remember. Things, circumstances, and experiences bring pleasure, not happiness. Pleasures come to pass. Happiness is everlasting, and pleasures require outside stimulation. Happiness is spontaneous from within. We are wired from birth for happiness, remember that. Happiness has less to do with what transpires throughout our day and more to how we interpret what transpires. Sometimes people are, sedu are seduced and have convinced themselves that happiness is what we get when we get what we think we want. Remember, happiness is what we get when we get what we think we want. But what is it that we really want? We want happiness. But we assume that what we think we want, our worst need, is what is going to make us happy. Rather than about getting, happiness is about seeing life is in its entirety as worthwhile and meaningful. Happiness is finding meaning in the most casual of experiences and the smallest of things, meaning. Happiness is that which allows you to see what you do as meaningful, even when it is mundane or insignificant to others. Happiness 
allows you to see purpose and value to life, even in the midst of the greatest challenges. Happiness allows you to appreciate subtle things. I was walking across the road with my granddaughter, and I held her hands, and I felt the softness. There was just something indescribably beautiful about that soft innocence that a feeling of bliss just went through me. If I was distracted thinking about the traffic, or, well, I should, but I, and yes. <laughs> but I was so present in the moment that the beauty, ah, even now I'm thinking about it, the beauty of those soft hands just sent a rush of bliss. Perhaps, and I'm sure, it was not just the stimulation, but the state of consciousness that I was in that would allow me to feel and appreciate that moment. Happiness allows you, like Mandela, to come out of prison after 27 years and place your jailers in the best seat at your inauguration as the first black president of South Africa. Sonia, don't ball. Okay. Happiness causes you to infect the entire world with your consciousness so that all can see the glory of God manifest in you and as you. Nelson Mandela, Madiba, Roli Laha, whatever, right? <laughs> Practice it and I forget, sorry. <laughs> you know what is meant, meant the troublemaker, but it's a different kind of trouble, right? It's one who, although he would not stand for anything less, so I'm not undermining your goals, anything less than the highest and the best and the abundant life for all, because it came out of an experience of intense love and a happiness which he had learned to cultivate by going within and saw his time in prison for 27 years an opportunity rather than a punishment. He was able to be a point, can you imagine, one man and the whole world owns him wants to connect, wants to be part of his experience and feel a sense of just pure happiness to know that he existed. Interesting thing for me is that he refused to make his captors treat him as subhuman. But first he had to know himself. He knew himself enough to elevate them to the status of gentlemen. In so doing, he remained a prince and called and saw his, guard, his warders or jailers in a different light. An, approached, an enlightened approach to life allows one to experience happiness in the midst of physical suffering deprivation, and what most people would call poverty. When people are happy, they think more clearly, they make better decisions, and research shows that productivity increases when people are happy. The happiest people in the workplace are those who see their contribution to the whole as significant and important. I am, I am doing a course out of Tel Aviv University in Israel, it is called an introduction to the history of the human race. We are now wrapping up. And one interesting conclusion comes out of observing and comparing populations who are living modern lifestyles in wealthy circumstances with populations currently living in similar conditions to hunter-gatherers of ancient civilizations, right? So there are people who are still living as if they were, you know, people lived thousands of years ago. 
So using a standardized yardstick for happiness, the two populations were found to be equally happy. The conclusion is happiness is not determined or even influenced by external conditions, but by the way you see yourself and your relationship to the whole. Can't repeat that enough. Who is to say that a proud Maasai herder feels less rich, less happy, less fulfilled than a multimillionaire living in a condo overlooking the Hudson River? Happiness is finding meaning, and from whence cometh meaning of the highest order. And knowing, and from thence cometh meaning of the highest order. From knowing that we are each individually and uniquely chiseled out of the nature of God, the beautiful beauty, the all-powerful power. I am reminded of the favorite poem of Nelson Mandela. The words which he said inspired him to act in ways which conquered the minds of the people of the world. He used it as he was in prison. It is called Invictus, and I'll just read two, two of the four verses. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Mandela was one who did not give up or give in. He said to have paid the price of lost years of freedom, lost contact with his family, and but when interviewed, he admitted that he had lost that. However, he said, it means refusing to feel shame or accept debasement when you people think you have erred. Mandela said to Bill Clinton when he was beset by the Monica Lewinsky affair, you cannot give your detractors your heart and soul, keep it for yourself. <laughs> keep it for yourself. Happiness means that you are content with a decision which you make even when it may have cost you because you know it's for the greater good. Mandela told a reporter who interviewed him and asked him if there was anything you regretted about life. The answer came swiftly and definitely. I regret nothing because the things which attracted me pleased my soul, my soul. That is where you reside. Nelson Mandela made it his business to treat his waters as humans, even when he, they did not treat him initially as human beings. In one humorous episode, when a friend visited him in prison, he was being marched by 12 guards. Mandela turned to his guards and introduced each of them by name, first name and last name, to the friend. He said to the friend, please meet my guard of honor. What? what kind of consciousness is that? Friends, happiness means keeping your head when all about uh, losing theirs. It means not buying to me the hype about recession and economic doom. It means refusing to be cynical about other people's happiness. If they look happy, mind your own business. You don't know what is going on in their head. Right? <laughs> not being disparaging about others' good fortune. It means being able to experience another's happiness. That's another research finding, that when other people have had a joyful experience and you see it, rejoice with them, and somehow you become more happy. And guess what, too? They say when, when you see people like winning the lotto, instead of saying, boy, I wish it was me, say, wow, I'm so happy, and then it might be your turn next, right? <laughs> Happiness multiplies itself. The happier you become, the happier you become. <laughs> Happiness is infectious. That is when people delight and cheer up in your presence. Uh, when you think about them, they don't have to be present, just think about them, and, and they become happy. Happiness is seeing beauty regardless of what controls you. Cahill Gibran says, the optimist sees the rose and not the thorn. The pessimist stares at the thorns, oblivious of the rose. Now, there are, I am saying all of this 
but there are some interesting techniques which have come out of new thought movement and maybe come out of the ages. But they are now coming out of no other than Harvard course of happiness and given to you by the professor of the science of happiness, right? It sounds familiar, right? He says, the first thing you have to do is to be grateful, be present. They found that the difference between what you are expecting to have and what you are currently seeing that you have is what causes happiness or unhappiness. That one is proud. You have to, may have to think about it when you go home, right? But it means that while you are desiring and planning for something else, be content. Be appreciative. Not just grateful. There's a difference between grateful and appreciate. Because you can't be grateful what you don't appreciate, right? So you appreciate what you have. So they say this is a powerful, powerful um, tool. And they have researched it and they have found it to be so. Then the other thing is, interestingly, and I have been resisting doing this and I, except once or twice, but I'm putting it to you. Remember that Susan Goff did some workshops on journaling. They said that is very important. Because sometimes in, you grasp in the moment something, a moment of great joy, and if you record it, you will have it there for posterity, for your own self to review. But the act of writing seems to etch it into your consciousness. So journaling, right? Meaning you write down on a day-to-day -day experience um, thing, um, what you find happiness, the moments of happiness, right? You'll be surprised how many there are. Then random acts of kindness and selfless service. Selfless service and random. I mean, just, just go and just do, you don't just do it to get. Allow your happiness to permit you to do something wonderful for anybody that you, as you feel it, act upon the impulse. Don't hold back. Selfless service, selfless service. And I, I really pause to affirm Jeannie and Denise who find let it be <laughs> you know why meditation huge whatever form of meditation you do if it even means turning up and just sit down and be still I don't try to relax either that's not meditation because you can't relax like that. You can't force relaxation. Just be. Imagine a university telling you that you must meditate, right? Yeah? And no less than Harvard, okay? No less than Harvard. Knowing your true value is happiness. A woman and I'm wrapping up. <laughs> a woman who was an awardee of CNN, um, they call it um, Heroes, right? An African woman. She was able, she was from Rwanda in the midst of the genocide. She was unable to give a maternity hospital, a school, a daycare nursery, a clinic, and even a cinema out of nothing. She had nothing right initially and she was radiant with happiness radiant with happiness and she did all of this in the midst of genocide the interviewer could not resist asking her how she was able to do so little in the midst of that horror so much sorry so much with so little sorry her response was simply, God owns everything. My father owns everything. And she said then, which was the one most profound, because I've heard the other one before, riches is not what you have, but who you 
are. And it is out of that knowing that made her so happy. And Thomas Browning said, I am the happiest man alive. I have that in me that can, can convert poverty to riches and adversity to prosperity. Who is that? What is that? The living spirit almighty. Do you know that you are sons and daughters of the living God? Yes, you do. So go live it and be happy. And so it is. Thank you.